Welcome to industry events here at Plymouth University. Thank you to students from our program and from Plymouth Marjon University, Plymouth College of Art and Falmouth University for joining us today. Thank you for our guests for joining us. Um, and now Dr. Al Gore, who is the leader of BA Filmmaking at Plymouth University will introduce our session. Hi everyone, um, thanks for coming. I think we've still got a minute or two to go, but um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of kick off the, the event by um, giving you some context as to why we wanted to set this up as, as we have. And I think Linda's gonna come back in a moment and um, talk to you a bit more about the sort of details of the event. But one thing that you know we wanted to do when we were given this opportunity to to be involved in these series of, of, of sessions um, connected with the Royal Television Society was to do something that I think a represents our course and our teaching and some of the ways that we like to think about filmmaking and film and television production and I think also to open up a sort of lively and diverse and hopefully interesting discussion around a very kind of changed contemporary landscape in which, you know, media has become converged. There's all these possibilities to, um, to, to create films or connect with audiences across a variety of different platforms. And I think one of the things that we wanted to do by bringing in some of our brilliant and really exciting guests, and thank you guys for coming um, um today was to um get some insight for you guys for students as to what's happening now <clears throat> and i think the intention with that is to think about you know what can be next what can be innovative what can be exciting um and and how can you kind of carve out your space in in this field as we kind of enter or, or, or move really close or move directly into you know the mid 21st century um, I think obviously film for, for us is a very new medium. It's still kind of emerging and and finding what it is, I think, because let's face it, film was first screened, you know, only 140 you know, odd years ago. So as an art form, it's new. And I think um, all these new platforms and technologies um, and new ways in which moving image is, is, is finding its way across the world, both in terms of cities and galleries, online, on your phones, in cinemas, on TVs. It's just really exciting and um, offers students, I think, a great opportunity to think about where they might want to go with their filmmaking. And it offers opportunities for people to, to engage in it in a professional way. So, um, so what I'm going to do is very quickly just say thank you for coming. I think everyone should be here now. Um, I don't want to waffle too long. I want to get into the discussion. What we've set up is, is really an open sort of forum. Um, we've brought in some interesting people, as I said, and people that, that contribute to our course um, in a really dynamic way um, in the first, se first session. And we wanted to get um, a kind of um, a broad a broad amount of perspectives in this first section first section um, so we have um, people that are you know working in industry or people working in, in, in artist film industry or people working in production management and behind the scenes so to speak so that it gives um, the discussion a real good um, opportunity um, to develop some, some interesting perspectives from from all these different places and viewpoints um, then the second half, we've got some brilliant students of ours that just graduated, Joe and James, I'm hope, hoping that you've turned up, I'm sure you have, they're very professional, <laughs> but um, they're going to be in the second section and we wanted to bring them in because we thought they would directly be useful to a lot of our um, students who are in education right now because they literally graduated like three months ago and they are um, finding their way in industry both you know, in, behind the scenes and, and through being, a, a, you know, a part of a crew and, and a DOP and so on and so forth. So, so they'll be able to speak to um, you, the students, in a real direct way about their experiences, what differences there are as they move out of university and into that world. So that's really it. These sessions kick off, or this is the first session to kick off a series of talks. 
Um, and the talks are going to be run by partner universities in the southwest. So there's going to be Marjans, Plymouth College of Art, Falmouth University, all running a, a talks in, in, in the coming weeks. I think we'll talk a bit more about that at the end. And, and they're going to be really useful for all of you that have come um, because they're going to be guest talks with production designers and, and script writers and so on. So please, please do come. But, but for us, we've wanted to kickstart this whole series with a diverse, as I said, and hopefully enlightening discussion around film making industries, how we think that there's a change and um, you can think about filmmaking industries in a different light perhaps, um, while still very much similarities from the 20th century. Um, maybe there are, and we, we all know, I think there are new ways of, of engaging in the art form of film and, and what those opportunities, opportunities there are out there for you all. So the, this is in um, association with the Royal Television Society and I'm now going to Stop talking and pass you over to Linda. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming and listening. Cheers. Thanks, Al. Well, we've got a really exciting lineup of guests, and um, they're going to share some of their experience and advice um, for students hoping to work in the field of you know, TV and film and like this evolving media industry. And um, we're going to be talking to um, people who have worked in film as artists, we're going to be talking to people who've worked in production, we're going to be talking to people who are members of the RTS, we've got a whole range of people um, and a lot of people we want to hear from and what, you know we really want to hear from you too you know because you're really important you're the students so you're really important we want to hear your voices and managing the chat for us are students from the program here and on this first panel is Ellie Lenny and uh, with other students, Ellie organised a media conference with me in June and uh, she's been running our social medias ever since. So Ellie, how's that been for you? It's been, um, it's been interesting to say the least. Um, I worked with last year's um, third years, so the graduates who have just gone through the filmmaking course as of this September basically. And we all worked together alongside Linda to help create a mini producers conference, as it were, um, inviting many people from across the media industry to come and talk to us about their jobs, about how they kind of, what the typical day-to-day -day life is and what kind of things they would recommend for people who want to go into media after university. Um, and as Linda said, actually, I've been afterwards, I've been helping to run the social media accounts. So I run the Facebook and Twitter pages for the producers conference. And I've been keeping them up to date every week with little look backs, basically, from that conference. And it's been really fun to, um, you know, keep the conference alive, keep um, the engagement up with regards to just basically keeping that content going and giving people reminders of the people who we spoke to um, at the producers conference and kind of giving them reminders of what they may need to do if they want to go into those different types of careers. Brilliant. Thank you, Ellie. You've done a lot of hard work on that. So thanks a lot. And she's managing the chat in this session. So get your questions in, please. That'd be great. Um, so this conference is um, split into two panels of one hour starting now. So let me introduce our first panel of guests. Um, so we have Katie Richardson and Katie is an artist working in Plymouth. Her movie image and sound work draw on research into trauma and haunting and she's exhibited internationally and she holds an MA in contemporary art practice from the University of Plymouth and she teaches experimental practice on the BA filmmaking course here with us. And we have also Esther May Campbell. Esther is a filmmaker, a director, a photographer and writer in 2008, she received a BAFTA award for best short film for her film, September. Her debut feature film, Light Years, premiered in the International Critics Week section at the 77, 72nd edition of the Venice Film Festival. She's worked in TV, directing Channel 4 dramas like Skins. She's directed Wallander with Kenneth Branagh. And she, as I say, she's a stills photographer, um, been involved in a project working with displaced children. 
Um, I noted in an article, um, Raising Film website, where she talks about the need for a new way of making film that allows for integration and care of her cast and crew. And we're also joined by um, Jack Hinchy. Please welcome Jack. Afterwards, he worked as a trainee researcher for the BBC. Um, he worked for a while in marketing and then back in to TV as a production coordinator at Drama TV in Bristol. He's since been pr promoted to senior production coordinator. He's worked on dramas, documentaries, entertainment studio shows for CBBC, Channel 4 and the British Sign Language Broadcasting Trust. So my first question to you all is how did you first start working in your field? So could I ask Esther first, if that's OK? Yeah. Uh, ooh. Well, I, I find this a, a tricky question. It, it should be simple, but it's I don't know whether one answers it from the point that I became interested in in pictures and human nature and light or whether it's the time from the outside world goes, oh, look, there's somebody who seems to be working in a pre-designed industry so I don't mean to be tricksy but it might be uh, I might want to interrogate the question back again <laughs> so what, what what do you mean when you ask it I suppose what really intrigues me Esther is like you you are across and a, a real range of things so we've got you working and winning BAFTA awards you know for a film like you know the, you know the uh, the light years and then the, there's you working with your photography <clears throat> There's working with somebody like on a, a quite a mainstream program, shall we say, potentially Wallander. So like you're across all of these different areas of filmmaking and artistry. And it's like just to try and find where the heart of that is for you. And then how that starting point, how you got your first <laughs> break in. Because I think many of our students really are very interested in all of those areas. You know, we would love to go mm. into any of them. But you you, you are working in all of them and, and very successfully. Mm. But just trying to work out how you got in. Uh, we, what happened mm. first? Did they happen together? Well, I, would, I would say to your students that it's not linear and you don't ever get in. You, you know, I would say that is a kind of false narrative perpetuated by by almost by the stories that get told again and again about hu about how humans lead their lives. So, so sorry to sort of throw that spanner in the work. But, you know, I think if I think uh, if I was put in a room, I'd probably make something with the tools that I was given. And I became interested in. I got bullied quite a bit at school and so I, 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 there was a dark room and I went into the dark room and I took pictures and that was my way of kind of coping with the emotional distress of that. Um, and so I had this photographic um, language that I built up in my teens and then I got interested in, I volunteered in the theatre and then I worked in the theatre when I was about 18 or 19 and I was interested in human dramas and I worked in the theatre as an assistant stage manager, which basically means you wash people's clothes and bring them cups of tea and you open the curtains, you know. And um, that was a, a Stephen Burkhoff play and it had quite fine actors in it, like um, Anita Dobson and Steve, Stephen Burkhoff, who are of the last century, but were kind of big in their time. And at 18, I saw that I was, I was really curious about how um, a director might, enable a performance at what point that enabling might be coercive and non-consensual and so that got me kind of curious what was going on there but what also I understood was when I looked at the audience it was sort of middle class white people with white hair night after night and I thought whatever I do I'm not sure if I want to preach to the converted and so uh in my 20s I did a degree at Bristol Uni and I misread wasn't a very good reader and I misread the prospectus <laughs> so I thought it was doing a different degree anyway it's another story but I came and I, and I really struggled with the academic work because it was at that time it was kind of Foucault and feminism and Hitchcock and handbags and deconstructing uh, images with a kind of cultural theory perspective which I was curious about but I really struggled academically and so I spent my time volunteering on a very 
fancy, expensive, practical MA at Bristol Uni. And while I was there, I learned how to be a runner, how to how to um, cable uh, uh, cables for lights, which I really loved. Um, and I watched uh, young filmmakers produce and direct films. And so after I came out of my degree at Bristol Uni, which I just got through by the skin of my pants, um, I'd, I'd been around quite a few student film sets. And so I got a job. Um, I was a cleaner for a bit and then I worked in an animation company for a bit and I would then make films when I had enough money and enough mates to kind of take them with me on a ride somewhere. And so, and that's pretty much always been the, the rhythm of my work life, um, you know, paid work um, and then sort of cocking around work. And if you're lucky to come together, you know, um, so that was a bit of my journey, but it it's never particularly felt linear. You know, those that sounds linear, but then it's dropped back round and changed in circles again and again. Uh, and I think that's partly because I'm older and that's natural to happen. And I also think because we're in really peculiar times and we're all responding to this shift in culture and what what human and non-human cultures need at the moment. And it would be strange to imagine a kind of linear, single-minded, directed career in these times. Is that is that helpful? Yeah, I think it's very helpful, I, really. And also lockdown has changed things. I mean, it's changed everybody. Here we are all coming from our living rooms and, you know, it's sort of very human, isn't it? It's like we're, we're, we're presenting more as ourselves, I think, rather than here we are, you know, um, there's less of a facade. And I love that personally. I think that's wonderful. And I, I like the fact that you were saying about your friends, because did you know, in, with your crew, did you have you taken your friends with you or have your friends taken you with them? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, less they've taken me with them because people I don't really hire directors unless you work in TV. And I haven't got any friends that became kind of TV producers or execs. And also because I, I, I consciously left TV about 10 years ago. But um, there's my mate, Will, who I've known since I was 23. And he's set to shoot a feature with me once we raise the finance. So, and yeah, John Minton, who I've known again since my early 20s. And he does a lot of the visuals for Porter's Head. And he's set to edit it. So, yeah, I've very much gone back into those friendships as well. Having having left them for kind of hot names, I've come back to them because I love them. Oh, great. Thank, thanks, Esther. I'm going to ask Katie that same question now, but obviously we'll come back. And obviously in the chat, you know, we have loads of questions for you all. But Katie, can you just tell us about how you first started working in your field? Thanks for joining us as well, because you're you're actually setting up your exhibition, aren't you, at the moment? I am, yeah. Can you hear me okay? We're in a slightly echoey kind of space. Is it okay? Brilliant. Yeah, so, yeah I'm, here with, uh, good. I'm here with Laura Porter, who is one of the directors of uh, an artist-run gallery space in North Devon. And I'm here setting up my solo show, uh, A Cake of Painted Tin, which we've handily positioned ourselves <laughs> in front of so that you can get a sense of what we're doing here. Um, so my, I also share with Esther a really wonky and like uh, messing about kind of route into everything. Um, so I went to uni at the age that people usually go to uni and at the time it wasn't the right thing for me. So I spent 10 years working mostly in hospitality <laughs> and then um, when I got towards the end of my 20s, um, and it's important to say that I went to uni in at Goldsmiths in London, but I was studying French at the time, and I still have a real connection with, and in fact, this, this show I'm setting up here is based on um, uh, a series of novels. So there's still quite a strong kind of literature content in my work and it was the literature that I was particularly interested in when I was studying French um, but I didn't really want to study French enough that I wanted to do the year where you have to go and be in France for a year and for some reason that was the point where I decided this wasn't the right course for me um, and then went away and did work but because I'd been at Goldsmiths I've been surrounded by um, one of the best 
art departments in the country. And it, it must have done something to my mind because a few years later when I wanted to um, go back to uni, I just wanted to do art. And I hadn't really thought about art too much in the meantime necessarily, although I've always been someone who makes things in a, in a relatively casual at home kind of way. I've always kind of uh, drawn and made up stories and written songs and those kinds of things. Um, but I wanted to go and study art. So I did that at the end of my twenties. Um, and then, I and at that point I don't think I realized that film could be part of art so I got really interested through doing that course in moving image as part of art so I come at the position I'm in now from a fine art background thinking about moving imagery in the way that you might think about painting or you might think about photography and bringing in those kind of fine art contexts to moving image. Um, I've not had any connection with any kind of film or TV industry. The way I'm coming at it is always as a kind of um, solo practitioner who then collaborates with other people based on skills I need to bring in. So I guess in some ways I've found myself in a kind of director-like position without knowing all any of the terminology that's around that idea. So my projects are always self-driven. Um, the project I've been working on here has been funded by the Arts Council. Um, so I applied for a project grant um, of £15,000 to make this work. I was successful in getting it. It's enabled me to make the work that you see here, um, primarily spending most of it on bringing in the skills that I don't personally have, like all the great DOP skills from people on courses like this. So don't forget artists when you're looking for employment. We also employ DOPs, uh, sound makers, all various different kinds of skills. Um, and then the opportunity with Laura came up when the project had already started. So through an artist studios um, that I'm involved with in Plymouth called CAST, um, the galleries set up. So you've started up relatively recently, haven't you, and had an arrangement with Cast. Do you want to talk about how that happened? Yeah, well, we only set up a year ago, um, which seemed a bit mad to be setting up an art gallery during a pandemic. But, you know, we're here, we're doing it, so that's all good. Um, and we were introduced to Ben, um, who works at Cast, which is also an artist-led space. I think it's one of the biggest in the country, isn't it? Uh, I think that might be right, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, they're, they're a really reputable artist-led space and we're kind of a much smaller fish, but I think we had a lot of similarities in what we were trying to do, being in the southwest and um, wanting to kind of challenge um, some of the artists in the area um, and put on some kind of more exciting stuff than, well, we're in North Devon, there's a lot of work that's kind of geared towards tourism, um, so we started having a conversation with Ben, um, who said we have artists who are in the studios here, maybe we can do some kind of exchange, and we thought, well, why don't we um, get one of the artists in your studios to come and have a solo show in the gallery um, as a way to kind of push forward um, with the project and take it to the next level. I mean, we're, we're quite a big space. Um, it's not too big that it's really intimidating, but it's big enough that it's challenging as a solo artist, I think. So we just asked um, for any of the artists at past who are interested to just sort of send us a link to what they're working on at the moment. And we really liked the sound of what Katie was doing, um, especially with a focus on trauma, which is something that's normally quite internal and something that kind of maybe goes quite unspoken about and it's something we we hide a lot of the time so I was really interested in sort of where that might go and at the time we didn't know visually what it would look like we just kind of had the ideas behind the work um, and Katie sort of put together a proposal with a sort of bit of a timeline and we met um, here and at Katie's studio and we're setting up the show now so it's really exciting. It is exciting. Thank you for telling us about it and about that, that how those connections were made and the conversations and the process. 
And I'm just wondering, do you think there are opportunities for our students to find that sort of funding or that connection? Can they join these groups that you've mentioned? Like, is that possible? You can, for sure, yeah. So I want to mention um, a couple of different groups. So one of the things that's been most key for me in finding a way to operate as a self-employed uh, creative practitioner um, is the network that you have around you. And so I um, helped set up, we didn't have a network that felt like it would do that job in Devon and Cornwall um, once the Plymouth Arts Centre had sadly collapsed. So Plymouth Arts Centre used to have an associate scheme, which is a scheme that a lot of galleries have whereby artists who live near that gallery can join a scheme which then provides them with access to talks by the artists who are showing there, for example, or um, crit sessions with visiting speakers or various professional development opportunities which are hooked onto the programme at that gallery. And Plymouth Arts Centre used to have an associate scheme um, which had been running for about 10 years, I think. Um, I moved back to Plymouth towards the end of its life. So I didn't get to experience it very much, but there were people who'd been involved with it for a long time. And then the Arts Centre lost its NPO funding, which is a, a, a part of the Arts Council funding, which deals with organisations on a more ongoing basis. Um, and they unfortunately lost their funding and had to close. So with it went the only associate scheme in the area. So some of the people who've been involved with it for a long time and other people like me who wanted something like that to exist, set about setting up an organization which could provide some of those opportunities, employment and um, skills development, professional development for artists and creative practitioners working locally. So about three years ago, we set up an organization called CAMP, um, it's camp-plymouth.org. I'll stick it in the chat in a second. Um, and we are a membership scheme whereby anybody who considers themselves um, an art practitioner of any kind um, can join. There is a small membership fee, but it works out at about five pounds a month. And once you're a member, you have access to a residency program, a talks program, all kinds of paid opportunities like mentoring, um, coaching, um, opportunities for exhibition, all kinds of things. So it's a little bit like a kind of step into the professional world while maintaining some of that structure that you have in your student world. And a lot of us find when we leave education, if we're trying to go into a self-directed or self-employed way of working, that that jump from people around you because you're all on the same course into how do I make this happen all by myself is really hard. So organisations like CAMP exist to give you some sort of support framework around you so that while you're finding a way as a kind of self-employed practitioner or employed practitioner it doesn't matter um, there's just people around you with different experiences different ways of working different skills that you can share and also a really important just support network around a bit like you have with your course mates so if you're staying in the region or if you're from here um, there are no kind of, you don't have to pass any kind of like selection process or anything. You can just join camp as long as you're based in Devon or Cornwall. And I would recommend third year students maybe to join now so that you already have that network as you transition out of university. I, I wish I'd had that. And that's part of why we've set this organization up. Um, there are similar organizations in other parts of the country so if you're not staying in Plymouth or nearby um, and you therefore don't qualify for the funding that we've got in place to make this for Devon and Cornwall then look for something similar where you are going to be because they can be super helpful um, and especially if you're in a region like we are in Devon and Cornwall where there isn't a huge amount of visible things to kind of hook yourself into it can be super useful because a lot of the things I've heard about as opportunities have come through 
being involved with camp or being involved with cast or plugging into these kind of organizations whereby you just join a thing and make yourself a member of a thing and that increases your visibility so much so I'd really recommend students to join now if you're eligible, eligible as a student or as soon as you're not one. Brilliant. Katie, Laura, thank you. That's so useful. And the fact you're going to put some links in the chat, that is well, so yeah. Thank you. And then, um, Jack, can we just come to you, please, and just ask that same starting question, which was like, how did you get started in your field? Um, Wow. I'm going to dodge that question quickly and just play a quick game for my own amusement. Um, can you all turn on your cameras one second? And you can turn them off again afterwards. I just want to play a quick game. It's a good game. <laughs> you oh, it's, it's very effective. I feel like I should be a Scientologist or something. Um, so, all right, we're still waiting for... Come on, Maddie Owen. Come on, Emily. Nachi, Milo. Um, so um, I, I went to the University of Gloucestershire and I used to do lots of talks like this. And I was just intrigued how many of you want to go into TV. So if we could do a quick sort of take me out where turn off your cameras if you don't want to go and work in TV, just so I can work out who to aim all of this at. So okay, three, two, one. Okay, so <laughs> Harvey was like, no. <laughs> okay, well, do you know what? I'm happy I can direct most of this at Christian, Atri, and Sam Smith and Ethan. Um, so basically... <laughs> like, there's loads of people here. Put their cameras on. I don't know if you've got the full... Um, you know, no, no. Like domino effect. It's like a check of all the faces. So I think the best piece of advice I could give you guys is... Um, is to use opportunities and talks like this to just network with people like Esther um, and Katie, um, you know, because when you leave university, you don't really have these sorts of opportunities. You don't have kit access to really good kit or speakers or alumni. Um, and these are the sorts of best opportunities for you to get into TV and film and music and like anything in the arts, really. Um, so I went to the University of Gloucestershire and a long story short, basically we had a speaker come in um, and we all just asked them for a job in TV and then we ended up working on the X Factor and then Britain's Got Talent and then it, it just snowballed from there. So basically um, your, your career can start right now if um, just speak to Esther. I'm sure she'll hire you. <laughs> or, um, you know, just, just start speaking to people whose careers you find very interesting. Um, and then it's more of a case, like Katie was saying, that you end up collaborating with people that you really like and creating stuff that you find really interesting. And that's it, really. And, 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 Jack, and Jack, can I just ask you, I mean, you work across a range of uh, programming, so drama, documentary, all of, mm. all of those. I mean, how, what skills will our student, students need to bring to, you know, these conversations, if they are interested in working in TV, what, what sort of, what, what sort of skills should they bring? What sort of attitude should they bring when they do meet people that they're obviously interested in? I think that was a key thing that you were saying, mm. identify the person with whom you connect, you know, that you've got a real, real um, sense of this person is interested. In. I think if everyone can go off of speaker mode and look at gallery mode and then look at Ben and CP, and you'll see that they they clearly get on with each other. They're very happy. They're very smiley. Um, who else have we got? We've got Rose, Ellie, basically Charlie, people who are very happy, friendly, inquisitive, curious, um, determined. Um, these are the sort of skills I think that you need to kind of embody in TV, it's, it's about making friends and um, because <laughs> my production manager is laughing opposite me, you basically end up working very long, intense days with each other. And that sounds like a really hellish job to have if you're not working with people that you like um, and people who all have the same sort of shared goal. Um, so 
yeah I, I guess what I'm trying to say is be really nice people be um super into tv film drawing photography um and pursue that don't pursue god this is a very sort of white middle class liberal privileged thing to say but like you know chase and do what you want to do uh in in life um because you'll find that um the job that you end up doing if you really enjoy it isn't really work at all it's having a laugh and tv and the creative industries is very much about just sort of having fun can i just ask you do you think has the pandemic had a massive effect on your field and your area I and mean, what's, what's gone on oh god are there more opportunities coming from that change that must have happened from this changing scenario that we've all gone through? I mean, I definitely have to do a lot more paperwork since COVID was a thing and people want to stay alive. So I need to do more health and safety forms, buy everyone masks. Um, but it's, it's definitely changed how we film things. Like I did um, a shoot yesterday for, I think I can say it's for BBC. I can't say what it's about. But we filmed a celebrity over Zoom. We had people at their house filming from a distance. And then I recorded um, the footage as well. So although I'm terrible with a camera, I can now tell people that I helped film something. Um, so, yeah, like the way you make programmes has definitely changed and always changes as well. I think um, I think it was Esther saying that... Um, the way you sort of create is ever evolving and she was looking at like how things change and definitely the pandemics changed how we make things but even things like I remember Doctor Who started filming in HD and they had to completely change how they made props because like the quality of their prop making was, was looked really bad in HD so they had to like up that so the creative world's always changing and um it's challenging to keep up but um it's, it's good fun as well I was really lucky um uh, there's a director called Paddy Russell and when I started um she was the person who sort of took me under her wing she directed some Doctor Who's and um she also um yeah sort of like shared some of the footage or some of the sound material so I could just sort of actually have parties at home my own little party <laughs> parties at home actually but yeah um you're right it's sort of it, it changes the technology changes as well like you say over zoom we um in uh, our film drama course we filmed a 20 minute um drama over zoom or using zoom style technology so we so you're right you know we're all adapting and but I, i'm really interested to know what ellie um your um looking into the chat for us and looking after all of that. Do you mind taking over the chat and finding out what's going on, what people want to be asking to our guests, please? Yeah, so we, we have a few questions already, actually. Um, first few, uh, first couple, sorry, are from one of our lecturers here at the university, um, Dr. John Seeley. Uh, so firstly, question for Esther. Can you talk about how you managed to link up with a producer for your film and how much you think that producer-director relationship is important? Yeah, um, I can talk about that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's really important and it's, it's something that's hard to not get too neurotic about because you can realize it's important and then you could always be in doubt you know like you're going out with the wrong person like you know is this the one for me have I done it right should I go back to dating app or whatever you know and so you're not so, so that that neuroticism can kind of kick in but equally putting that aside it's important that if your instincts are saying that you're not seeing things the same way and and and, and the way that you want to make a piece of work doesn't come from the same source then it's probably going to be really, really painful because it's quite hard. I love there's this kind of Bill and Ted stuff going on in the uh, chat with a couple of the the, 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 the the coupled men. It's very entertaining. I just want to acknowledge that. Um, uh, um, and um, so it is massively important. And I've worked with quite a few different producers and I've had some great relationships and some terrible ones. Um, in TV, you don't get a choice. The, the producer is kind of in television drama, historically, uh, until you're super famous, uh, a position of sort of greater 
power in as much as making choices about what directors come and come off the show usually lend, uh, ends up with executive producers and sometimes producers. And so you, you're given who you're given. Um, the guy I'm working with now is, an, is a teacher at Falmouth. He's probably affiliated with all you lot called Denzel Monk, who um, produces for Mark Jenkins, um, you know, co-produced Bait and is, has just produced Innis Main. Uh, Mark's third feature, which is a kind of colour horror film, which looks like it's going to be fantastic. And working with Denzel is just like, for me, it's like, a yeah, it's, it's perfect. I can have all the strange, peculiar, vulnerable conversations that I long to have about process or story without feeling self-conscious or strange. Um, so, yeah, fi find someone who's on your side and it might take a while. You know, you might have to, a bit like going out with the wrong person, you might have to take a few knocks before... Um, you find your true love. <laughs> I know that experience all too well. <laughs> um, next question um, from John is for Katie. How important is it for independent artists and filmmakers to engage with the funding process? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I suppose the answer is, do you want to get paid for your time? <laughs> And um, if you do and you're independent, then you probably need to engage with a funding process at some point. Um, for me, I've been able to support myself in my like general life in terms of having enough money by having what people refer to as a portfolio career now of having a few different skills and being able to earn enough from them that I can make my work in the way that I want to make it rather than in the way that I might have to make it if money was the, the goal. Um, for me, the, the creative work that I make, the goal of that is not money. However, by engaging with the funding process, you're able to pay yourself for the time you're using and therefore spend more time on what you're doing and make a better thing um, it also allows you to pay other people for their time which is very difficult to do as an independent um, practitioner uh, unless someone gives you money to pay them with so yeah for me the this this project that we're looking at here I was able to pay um, a very good cinematographer and I was also to, able to pay for time in a professional sound studio with a sound engineer. And those are things that previously, in previous projects, I would have made do with the skills that I have myself or skills that I could talk other people into, <laughs> uh, which only lasts so long. And there are lots of lovely people in the world, particularly in, in these kind of like network groups who will help you. But it's a very different kind of relationship. And in order to make something that feels like it's of a professional quality, when I don't own a cupboard full of kit, for example, um, the funding process is really important in getting access to skills, equipment, recording facilities, studio time, any of those kinds of things which you might usually have to make a compromise on. So yeah, I would think, it, I think if you want to be independent then engaging with the funding process is really important and the arts council is one way but there's also loads of funding opportunities through, through things like bfi that are really worth looking into um, and often one of the ways i've found works really well is to apply for different kinds of funding to support different parts of what you're trying to do so for example in this particular project um, the money to produce the work came from one funding source, but then Laura has a separate funding source which enables the show to be put on and me to be paid for some time to put the show on. So there's another angle of money coming into this same project um, with the same work, but from different places. And along the way, I also applied for an opportunity within camp for um, some mentoring on the project. So. If you keep your eye open for different opportunities of funding from different places, they can often combine into giving you quite a reasonable amount of uh, resources and money to work with 
even on one project. So yeah, I would recommend not applying for one thing and then being gutted when you don't get it because you never get all of them, but keep applying for lots of different things and combine them into a way that you can make work for what you want to do. Brilliant, thank you so much for that, Katie. Um, so our next questions are actually from a couple of our third years on the filmmaking course at Plymouth University. Um, Firstly, we've got a question from Harvey. I don't know if he wants to ask it himself or if he wants me to ask it. <laughs> he doesn't mind. Okay, so this is a question for Esther. What's your process for coming up with stories to write about and where do you draw inspiration from? Mm -hmm. That's a good, a good question. Um, I, I, think I, I think I start with image, you know, so with set of the short film I had an image in my head of a, a lad hovering above long grasses uh, sorry a woman hovering above long grasses levitating and a lad looking at her and and that was sort of like an image that sort of just burnt into my head and I was like what's the story behind this image um uh the piece that I'm working on the film piece the 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 long form film piece that I'm working on now um, I think came from like wanting me wanting to understand uh, the rupture in human history that got us into the kind of environmental messes that we're in now. And so the, the film that I'm working on now is set in the future in a rewilded Europe, uh, an all female uh, tribe. And, and our heroine has got the choice of kind of replaying historical um mistakes is too uh uh condemning a word but she's got the choice of going towards fencing and ownership of land and separating from the earth or remaining connected and interconnected to all non-humans and and more than humans and i think again that was a series of different images i, I remember seeing uh, a documentary about the kogi people who spend some particular members of this tribe spend the first 13 years of their life in a cave in darkness and then when they come out I mean they're fed and looked after and told stories but when they come out they're like oh my god this world is wonderful and then they spend the rest of their lives uh, known as mummers and protecting protecting the earth so it was a kind of an environmentalist um, seed so I, I don't often start with the story to answer your question. I, I often start with a theme or a series of images and then I have to painfully work backwards to story. And I'm massively envious of the people who can kind of knock stories out left, right and centre. I'm, I'm quite slow and quite deep. Um, it, is, that, is that a fair answer without sitting down and having a, a long, long conversation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just because like every time I write something, I feel like I'm never really doing anything new, if you know what I'm on about. I'm always writing about experiences I've had, but I was just wondering if there's anywhere else I can draw from, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I find, like, if you're... I think if you're getting stuck, there are a series of questions um, that I use when I get stuck that help unstick me. And I think it's really, really useful if you find you're kind of like... You feel like you're treading water emotionally, like you're like, oh, I'm back here again and I'm not enjoying it. If you're getting that experience as a writer... I think it's really important to get off the page, you know, like really get off the page. So if it's an experience that you've had um, and it's about, I don't know, a particular street that you grew up in, go back to that street, even if it's not part of your life, go and sit on that street, take photographs of that street. If it's about a particular culture and society, go and interview them. If it's about a particular um, relationships between fathers and sons read some books about fathers and sons read a psychology book look at paintings but get off the page because you're because if you're treading water if you feel like you're treading water you probably are get off the page and do some research and, and then come back to it is what I would recommend and I can I can send you some questions that I use when I get stuck if that's helpful um, we would need a much longer session to talk about the construction of story um and, and what we do when we get stuck. But th there, there's some things that I would, I would try and nudge you towards. Cool, thank you. Okay. So we've now got two questions from Christian. I don't know whether he wants to ask them. Yeah, I'll ask them. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, this one was for Jack. 
Uh, and it was just yeah. in general about kind of being a runner. Because I was and they tell me that being a runner is quite quick, or like you don't really do it for long. I'm not sure if that was the same with your experience. And as well, it's like, what do you actually do? Because everyone just tells me you just made coffees and teas. So I'm like, if I'm if I want to be a runner, like if I'm doing it for a year, that's you know that's a year of making teas and coffees. That's quite a long time. I'm just w- wondering for someone who's experienced it, like how, what was your experience of being a runner? Very good question. Um, I'll answer that in two parts. Oh, first of all, uh, we've got all of the CBBC guys in today, so you can probably hear them talking in the background. I think they're probably actually arguing over teas and coffees. Um, so never underestimate the power of a tea or a coffee because if you go up to someone and just say, do you want a cup of tea? It's a good way of you making a conversation with them. Um, and everyone always likes to feel special. So if, if you're offering someone a tea or a coffee, they probably feel like a celebrity. And I definitely always do it, even now as a coordinator, um, when I'm going to give my execs some bad news. <laughs> like, would you like a tea or a coffee? Um, in terms of what you do on a day-to-day basis as a runner, um, you can't really see them. I mean, camera's badly. Don't know if you can see the boy next to me with like very good hair. Um, but I bought him on recently as a runner. And what does he do day to day? He finds contributors for me. He for me. How wanky is that? Um, <laughs> for us, um, he finds locations. He goes out shooting. He's learning from our PDs who are sat on the other side of the room, like how to film, how to shoot um helps us find music for programs uh what did i do i i was quite lucky i was the celebrities assistant runner on the x factor and britain's got talent so i got to hang out with celebs and think that i was really cool um basically i think that my find succinct being a runner is like an umbrella term for anything that people want to make you do but also you should look at it as this is an opportunity for me to try everything and work out what I want to do because maybe you like filming maybe you like editing um, maybe you want to be a researcher and find people to be in programs um, so use being a runner as an opportunity just to try everything um, make lots of friends um, and I'll be honest with you it's the hardest job I've ever had I think you know you because you feel like you're constantly on and you're having to impress people um and i definitely take advantage of that with him i'm like go on no um best advice for being a runner is probably find an indie company um where you get more opportunity to film and edit and record sound and uh even do bits of my job which sounds a bit boring like location finding and things um rather than going to like a big company like the BBC or Channel 4. Um, yeah, go to, maybe there's some in Plymouth or some, there's definitely loads in Bristol that you guys could look at um, and just see what help they need. And then you get to try lots of different things and um, have fun, basically. I hope that answers your question about tea. I realise it spiraled a bit. <laughs> no, no, Can I add something? Just, just that, like... You, you, it's so important being a runner and like it, it on, on the one hand you haven't got too much responsibility but on the other hand you've got loads and it's when you say like Jack it's really important the things like turn up on time like that is that is like the number one if you've got a director waiting in the rain for 20 minutes because the runner is a bit pissed off because this job is a bit like the one they had before that's going to cock up the whole shoot so that so the, the runner is the oil to the whole shoot and 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 while you may feel irre- you may feel replaceable, actually the work isn't replaceable. The work needs to be done to keep everything running smoothly. So, and so you've got that responsibility. But on the other hand, it's a really great opportunity to learn. And most people, if you pick your moments and you show interest in what they're doing, why did you give that direction to her? Like, what, what were you thinking then? Why did you do that? Most people are flattered to be asked. Get your timing right. So I think you know it's going in there thinking you're going to you know don't let yourself get abused by working really late hours and really shit pay stick up for yourself but know that you're also going to slog for a bit but it's it's not at all a a a bad job it's it's a learning job and it's a crucial job I would say Jack right um yeah basically it's I do say it's the hardest job only in that like 
you, you, you could be doing anything that day um whereas with my job now I'm quite like lazy I'm like I know that I'm going to be doing budgeting and then a bit of research and then I can put lunch into my day whereas with runners you feel like you could be stretched in lots of different directions but just go for it um because like Esther was just saying you could spark up a really good conversation with someone and that could be the start of you getting into camera work or into editing or realizing actually you don't want to do tv you want to do film or you know it's those conversations that are going to start sort of shaping your career guys just to break in I know Ellie's got a few more questions but going on that tea and coffee thing my first work experience was at um, the Theatre Royal East 15 and um, the director there I said what do you need me to do and he said come and join me make these sandwiches I thought gosh the director's making the sandwiches and we're making these flasks of tea and then in the rehearsal after rehearsal we laid out the food and they ate that food and it felt like he was carrying them he was nurturing them and it felt like a massive I felt really like he'd show me such a great deal that day that, you know, his role was to sort of like be there, feed them. And just because it's a hard work, you're asking people to do a lot of things. And so um, the cups of tea and coffee, I completely agree with everybody else. It is a gift that you're giving. So it's sort of um, and one day someone will bring you a cup of tea and coffee, too. Any any more, Ellie, in the chat, please? So there's four more, but I'm going to combine two of them because they are quite similar so this is for esther what's the process of getting to the bafters or any other film festivals like venice for example well i didn't know i didn't know anything about bafta until i I got some texts from people one morning going oh congratulations well done and i was like what's everyone talking about and then i uh, wrote to my agent and she was like oh you've been nominated for a BAFTA so I didn't I didn't know until until the nomination came through and I think the process was that the film had already picked up a couple of awards at BAFTA appropriate festivals and then the producer or maybe a runner from the production company uh, who was given the job of submitting films to festivals submitted it to BAFTA and that was the first I heard of it. And then with Venice, we had um, a sales agent on the film who would have sent the film to appropriate festivals and done some screenings for them. And that's how I think it got selected, how it got selected there. When I was making short films, um, initially, uh, you didn't pay to submit them into festivals. You sent them in and uh, if they liked it, it would show. If, if, if it did well, you might pick up an award or something. And, and you know, that, that's what happened. I believe now that because more people are making more films, perhaps because of digital technologies makes it possible. And the, the festivals in Europe have kind of appropriated an American model. I think this is right, whereby you pay to submit your festi- your film and that pays the festival to look at it and, and do their admin. I don't know. I have really mixed feelings about that because I feel like you're creating the art or the content. Uh, and I think it's a big ask if, if you manage to get a film together to then have to raise a thousand pounds for its own distribution at festivals. But that seems to be the way it is at the moment. And I'm sure people at college will know more about, about that at the moment. I, I don't quite know how that works. Is that helpful? I think it seems to be I'm getting some nods in chat thank you for that um next question is for Jack and it comes from another of our third years on the filmmaking course um any tips to get started oh god um some of you have already heard my embarrassing story of how I started working in Bristol but for those of you who haven't it's Basically, I found this company that I work at now, Drummer TV, who I will say I now like I still work at. They all love me still. Um, But I messaged them for about I think it was over a year and called them and emailed them. I probably even messaged them on their posts on social media. And I was basically like, I really like Gym Stars, which is a really cute show that we make. It's basically like the Real Housewives, but for elite gymnasts who go on to the Olympics and you you follow their personal lives. It's really cute. Um, 
And I was like, yeah, I really want to work on this. And eventually, after a year, they broke down and said, okay, come and work for us. And on nights out, uh, they will tell bar staff um, or anybody we encounter in like smoking areas or on the street between bars that I was a stalker. Um, so that's so that's my legacy of how I ended up working in Bristol. Um, so yes, maybe stalk. No, my advice is find a company that's making a program that you really want to work on. Um, because ultimately like I was saying before that's what you'll find interesting to do um and like um Katie was saying about like sort of slogging away at doing something that you really love you do and like you know getting to the position where she's able to put on her own art show now like that's the position you want to get to as well as you know having that proud moment where you can say this is my exhibition or this is my name on a credit and I'm really proud of that or, you know, if you're like Esther, this is my BAFTA. Um, you know, that's that's the goal, isn't it? Um, so approach companies that you're really interested in. And um, if that doesn't work, just keep going and stalk them for a year. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. So this next one I've had through to my um, direct messages here on Zoom. Um, the A lot of us um, on the filmmaking course at Plymouth, we're going to be um the third years we're going to be graduating next year obviously how soon this is a general question for everyone um how soon should we start putting feelers out for work or where would you suggest would be best to look for work if anywhere at all well um uh, i'll come in quickly and then hopefully pass it on to katie and jack was that to everybody ellie i can't remember yeah, um, I think one thing is that you may know now or you may discover as you move through the work that you do, you may know that you're someone who just loves TV and you want to work in TV and you want to work on dramas or you want to work in light entertainment. You want to be part of the buzz of it. And that's what you're really interested in. And that's going to inform who you approach. You may know now or be thinking that you want to actually make your own stories. You want to tell your own stories and you think it might be in film form or photography or art, but you're not, you're not sure. And I think, you know, you, you'll, you'll, you'll discover these things en route, but you may have a sense of it now. And if you have a sense of it now, aim for what you're really passionate about. So if you love light and think about what you watch, if you love light entertainment, if you love shows like, uh, Bake Off and Strictly, then apply for the shows that lead you on that line. If you know you love uh, Netflix dramas, we'll start on the dramas, apply to Hollyoaks and Doctors and all that kind of stuff. If you think you're actually not even sure you want to work in the industry, but you want to be, you just want to make work, then go and make your work and get a job as a cleaner. So, and, and there's no judgment. There's no moral good on any of this. This is just about what gets you up in the day and what it, why you flick a screen on. And, you know, honestly, I stopped, I, you know, I've had to make adjustments in my own career choices because I've had to be honest about what I'm interested in. And I've had to drop quite glamorous looking gigs because it's no longer the thing that gets me up in the day. And that's okay too. So that, that's, that's my pennies worth. <laughs> I would say um, that it's not too soon, probably ever, to start looking at what things are around that, that could be potentially applied for. Um, in the particular kind of way that I work, the only consideration is that some things are not eligible for applications from students. But as you, I hope, have seen um, through our course um, social media, and I'm sure people from other courses here you have something similar there are lots of opportunities for things like short film commissions which are open to students and if you want to work in an independent way you could start applying for those right now as long as they don't have a clause in them that say that students are not eligible um, you might even find that uh, so recently I posted um, an opportunity for an organisation that's that's local to us um, near Plymouth is called Cine Sisters Southwest, who I've put the link for in the chat when we were speaking. 
Um, and they have some funding which they recently advertised for, I think it was five, um, about five um, short film commissions. And those were all el eligible for students. So what you might even find that starting to apply for those kinds of things now is an advantage because if you have something like that on your CV that you were able to make while you've got access to all the kit, <laughs> that can be really good. Often you get one gig by the quality of what you made for the last gig. So if you can make something of great quality now because you've got access to the equipment, get it into uh, something that's got somebody else's name on it, like Cine Sisters or being here at this gallery, or even if it's just on your CV, you've got a commission, 2021 commission from somebody or other. Getting started with that now can only help you in when you're then cast, you know, set off on your own path from the course, that you then have something on your CV which is already connecting you to some kind of professional way of working. So I would say get started right now if you know what you want to do. Um, but I'd also echo a lot of what um, Esther said, that if you're not sure what you want to do, maybe use this time to have a look into each of those things and make contact with people like you're doing right now in this Zoom and speak to people who have been making this their work um, while you've got access to those people. So even though third year is very full, um, in some ways, in terms of thinking, you know, you've got to write your dissertation, you're making this big project, but don't forget that part of university life is about having access to people who are further along the path that you might want to go along. So I would take good advantage of having conversations with as many different types of people and finding out what they do with their time when they're not teaching you or what they do with their time if they're zoomed in as a guest um, to find out how those things work and take advantage of that aspect of education as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Jack. <laughs> um, I've forgotten the question. Is it what would you do now? <laughs> um, basically how so for the third years here how soon should we start um putting ourselves out there for work or where in particular would you suggest looking for work someone told me um the best time to plant a tree was like 10 years ago and the second best time is now so plant your trees now I guess um you <sighs> uni is quite a safe bubble to start your tv career in because you can make mistakes if you go out on a shoot um or you start like an exhibition like katie's or you start writing a script like esther's um and it doesn't go right the first time you've still got your uni life um and like i think katie and esther were saying you've got access to kit now so start working on your own projects now um, start submitting them to award shows because just because you're students doesn't mean that um, you're any less than the people who are making TV or films or exhibitions right now. So if you don't do anything right now after what I've just told you, you're lazy. Um, but also start messaging people and saying, can I learn from you? Um, and hopefully they say yes. They will say yes. Everyone needs help. Brilliant, Jack. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for all of your answers. Thank you, everybody, for your questions here. Um, we would really like to show our appreciation now to our guests because they've been absolutely so insightful. So if you could join me in um, saying thank you to everybody because you've just been amazing. We're going to go um, to a short film now, which is two minutes long, which is of our students' work. Um, and then there'll be a place holder that says that we've got a five minute break so we can pop and get a cup of tea before going on to our next section where we're going to be talking to some of our students who've recently graduated to actually find out what that transition was like for them, you know, going from uni into, into work. But um, thank you very much to Jack. Thank you very much to Esther. And thank you very much to Katie. And thank you very much for all of the questions. Um, and um, Jamie, will you please show the reel? So thanks everybody for coming back. I hope we all 
managed to just have a quick break from um, all of the excitement. It's been a fantastic panel. That was just an amazing conversation, really enjoyable. Um, so welcome back now for our second panel, where we're concentrating on talking to recent graduates um, to get their insights into the early days of making that transition from university to working and making films and programs and working in artists' film, working in the industry. And managing the chat for us on this session is Rose Thompson and Ellie, Benny. Both are filmmaking students from the programme here. Um, and later in the panel, we'll be talking with Siobhan Robbie James, who's chair of the Devon and Cornwall Royal Television Society. Um, but now, though, I'd like to introduce you to the recent graduates uh, from Plymouth University. Uh, and that's Joanna Joseph Trebert and James Fox. And James Fox is a graduate, as I've said, from our filmmaking course. He's a videographer a filmmaker, a freelance production runner assistant. And during his final year, he worked with Nub Sound as a gimbal mounted camera operation, operator for the Nub Sessions, as well as on their live stream for Sennheiser. Uh, and this was his first taste in the industry. Now, since finishing in June, he's worked with ITV with Stephen Mulhern in for a penny and on ITV's Bling hosted by Gok Wan. He's also worked with Channel 5 and 24 on Happy Campers and with Finite Films as a second AC on a feature film called And Then Come the Night Jars. He's just about to earn his fifth film and TV credit with Channel 4 and Yeti TV on the Great Big Tiny Design Challenge, starting shooting on the 4th of November. So that's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and his main interest is in the camera department but he's gaining experience in a little bit of everything on every shoot and he's still figuring out what his path is but he has said that he's still very much enjoying any work he's getting um, especially so soon after graduating so lovely to have you here James and also we've got Joanna Joanna recently graduated from the University of Plymouth's filmmaking course, but already had secured a position at Ardman in March. And having worked for nearly 10 years as a production assistant for the Ardman Academy, Joan has been able to work with a huge, amazing range of people. And she says she's aiming to be a production manager at some point in the future. So it's just really great to have you back. And we just wanna know, tell us, what is it like to move from uni and then get those first jobs, because obviously that's where our students are. And you very recently just sort of set forth on that journey. Can you tell us about that, um, James? Yeah, and then um, it's a bit of a weird one because um, kind of, yeah, we talk about like the whole transition period, but it almost feels like um, you know, we're going from uni to work in the industry. It's like going kind of like for any sports fans, like going for like club level to international level and so um there's always like I, I'd say like the transition period happens in the first three days of of a job and there's not like unfortunately there's not a lot you can plan for because we'd all sit here and listen to people saying oh, okay when you get into the industry it's obviously gonna be longer hours it's gonna be more intense um but it is that's different saying it is different to actually being in it and I think yeah that transition period does happen in the first three or four days you know where you're learning on the job and then thing is once you've done those first three or four days you're kind of used to it and that transition period is over and you're like okay I'm in the industry now that's that that's that and so yeah it's it, all I can say is it becomes a lot more intense you do more hours um and the adrenaline is you know pumping all the time but after those three first three days you feel like you've been doing it for three years and and Joanna can you tell us a little bit about that that first movement from you know leaving us and going into Ardman and how that transition was made how did you do that um well I just want to clarify I've only been working for Ardman for 10 months not years oh I'm so sorry, was sorry. <laughs> my goodness I'm saying and she's a real old timer <laughs> <laughs> 10 years going um, but that's a good job just for when anyone got confused but um I think it's a bit different to James's experience just because um I went always at Ardman. Um, I'm a production assistant, so um, and I work for the academy, so it's not really on set at the moment. Um, so it was a bit more of a longer transition period because um, I'm in the office. Well, I was in the office and like sometimes, but um, yeah, and I think it's a lot more 
a bit more gentle in the sense that because it's an admin role um it's a bit more slower to get used to everything and get to know people and get to know the system so I was lucky in the sense I wasn't thrown into 12 hour long days and stuff like that but yeah um, and do you have any advice for people who are, you know, we're at this stage in on the course, you know, sort of with first, second and third years where we haven't graduated, but is there any advice from your recent experience that you'd share with, with us now then? Um, I think um, it's important to start looking for jobs. There's no, like, point waiting. You might as well start looking for jobs and start applying. Um, I know for a fact James has been applying for so many jobs <laughs> uh, and like I think that's just the best habit to get into um, because you'll never know who you'll hear back from and the sooner you apply the quicker people will know your name and even if you don't get an interview um, you can just make sure that they have your CV now so I think that's great um, and I don't know I'm trying to think I was really lucky enough I yeah I just had that was my first ever interview and I just made sure to take my time. Um, so don't stress. It won't, it's not too stressful. Well, I was my cat if you heard that. Um, but yeah, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it really. So you, t- you took your time. Was there something particularly about that company that you wanted to work for though? Was there something that drew you there? Um, no, it was just one of the jobs Alan and Mark posted on our Facebook group. And I thought on a whim I would apply. Um, yeah. So I just thought it sounded interesting. I'm, I did a lot of producing at uni. Um, so it was something I kind of wanted to go into. So I did apply. Well, it's amazing that you took your time and you just brought all of your energy and enthusiasm to that interview and clinched it. So well done to you. And then, so James, can I just ask you, you know, can you tell us any um, advice, you know, any tips, you know, right now for, for anybody, what's from your recent experience, what would you say we need to be thinking about? Um, I'll just say um, at, at this stage, I mean, it, it's something I think when I, when I was studying, I probably neglected a little bit, but when you're doing your, your, your short films, just don't, don't um, cut corners, you know, like when it comes to the clapboard or, or slating a scene, do it properly because you know, um, that second AC role, I was, I was meant to be a runner and they asked if I could be the, you know, the, the second AC on it. And I had to learn about like slating, um, you know, an hour before shooting. And that was my fault because in, in uni, I didn't um, pay attention enough to, can we slate the scene? Because it's like, well, I mean, in uni, I have a safety net. I'm just going to, you know, Alistair, you know, if I show Alistair, like, I'm not going to show him the part where it's out, out of shot, you know, the clapboard isn't there. I'm just going to cut that up. He would never see it. So um, it was kind of like, don't cut corners. And it, there's every single runner job I see, it asks for stuff like you know, data wrangling. Like, if you can do data wrangling, if you do logging. And so if I was to say at the moment, three things for everyone to start doing on a, on a short film, slate your scenes properly, wrangle the footage properly at the end of the shoot, um, and try out logging because there's no harm when you get into into the industry you might be asked to do it and if you're the person who steps up and says oh I can log suddenly that's the, the older person they remember um, and you know, apart from that I mean as Joanna said I, I wouldn't you know hold back on applying to stuff now like get your talent manager and LinkedIn set up now because when you leave uni that, that would there be that one job you need to apply for but you spent two days writing a cover letter and getting your talent manager then that job's gone. So you need to, just stuff like that, just, um, yeah, just kind of, yeah, just don't cut corners and get everything set up now, ready. James, maybe a bit later, if it's okay, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that data management and maybe, mm. you know, if that's okay, just a yeah, bit. Yeah, of course. And, um, you know, obviously um, your experience of clapperboarding, because like, I guess on each set, there's going to be different demands and how that was for you. But I know that um, obviously all the students here will be thinking, you know, what do we want to ask you to, you know, we've got you here. So um, I'm going to turn to Rose now, Rose Thompson, who is like um, managing the chat. So Rose, do you want to tell us what questions we want to be asking to James and Joanna, please? Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, hello. Um, And secondly, James, you said you are applying for a few jobs at the moment. And to continue the themes from earlier, where would you say is the best place to find jobs out of uni? And how did you go about doing that? Um, Oh, I'd say the first thing is um, the top tip is 
don't fall into the trap of paying for any sites. Um, stuff like Mandy, my first Robin film, production base, um, don't bother paying. You don't need to pay to get a job. Um, there's plenty of free things out there. And I would say actually sometimes, you know, stuff like my first job in film was actually a bit of a scam. I, I paid for a month of it for some reason. And it was, you know, awful. They say they give you advice from CVs and they don't. Um, and any any forums I looked at, you know, said, you know, it, it, it wasn't any benefit whatsoever. So don't pay for jobs. You don't need to pay for anything. Um, Facebook groups is the main thing. Um, everyone should join. There's, I, I've got a couple here, but like people in TV, um, runners and I can always put this in the chat later on but people on tv um, colon runners um, there's film and tv production crew uk uh, you know bristol film and tv join the south press you know film mail stuff like that there's they're posting jobs every single day um, and if you, you know, sign up talent manager and you, the pro version you can get because you can see who's downloading the cb and stuff but talent manager still allows you to apply to jobs without paying and even stuff like indeed um, you know, you for some reason when you put in your video for something, it will give you like, oh, I would want to be like a CCTV analyst. So it can be a bit weird, but there's sometimes there's gold in that pile where there are jobs that come up. Um, and then just the last thing is like, you know, preemptive applications because you might not always get replied, but they will always keep your CV on file and just make sure on your CV that you put that this CV can be kept for distribution purposes. So then they can start passing it around without asking you know, about data protection. So just you know, stuff like that. And just, yeah, biggest tips, don't pay for anything. You don't need it. Joanna, what do you think about that one as well? Thank you. Um, I think, <laughs> sorry, um, I think the hidden secret is Facebook groups. I'm a part of them. I look at them every day. And James is not joking, there's actually jobs posted every day and not like, for like small little companies like the BBC, Channel 4, ITV, everyone is literally posting on there. Um, and the people in TV runners one is so good because there's a guy on there who gives everyone advice. He talks about pay, he talks about contracts. So I would really highly, re highly recommend everyone joining that. Um, you learn a lot from it. I'm always reading it when I, before I go to bed. I'm like, wow, this is so interesting learning about contracts and stuff. I'm like, wow, this is great. I'm working, but I'm still learning a lot. But yeah, yeah, that's the best tip I can give. Um, yeah. Amazing. And along the same lines with social contacts, how have you found um, like speaking to people and social contacts been more useful in your work life since you've left uni rather than following the paths to find those opportunities? As in like um, networking and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that kind of will naturally come when you know, you're know you on a set and um, yeah, it, it's a tough one where it, if you get onto a set, you you just try and you, you talk to people and you make sure you leave their number. Um, and I have like so many contacts on my phone where I have their name and what production it was or something. And um, you know, I, I, I met a, um, a camera guy drawing bling who you know, was give, was sending me jobs. And actually this, this latest job I've got has been because of a... Um, AP sending me sending me the link, you know, um, because I befriended him, added him on WhatsApp, and he sent me the link a couple of weeks later. So, yeah, in, in terms of um, yeah, networking, I mean, just but there's some opportunities which you need to just take. Like, um, there's a I, I did some videography work for free with a guy called Matt James in Plymouth, um, but by doing that, I was now then getting paid jobs for 250 quid from him, and then he's saying, oh, next year I'm going to be filming some. Uh, festivals you know can you, you know, come join so it's sometimes about just putting yourself out there to meet people um and there's and most jobs you would get will come from people you know and also the um you know your friends on the course because they would get on something they were saying a second runner you would say oh, i know this person and then suddenly they're on it as well yeah i was going to ask about how important of the connections you've made with your course mates been since you've left have you stayed in touch have you got each other jobs has that been really useful or yeah um you know you stay in touch where you can I mean um and it has been has been useful because you know like knowing you know someone like Joanna who works at Ardman I mean straight out of uni you kind of made then aren't you and then you, know, you you impress them enough then it might be oh I know someone from uni who can join so you know because you never know what people are going to do and 
it's always good just to, it's, it's good to stay in contact anyway because you know collaboration is great and one day you might make a short film together or, or something like that but um you know when i when i was doing um the course when that was big, one of the biggest tips is stay in contact who you know and most people i've met on set have got a job because of a friend of a friend of a friend and i've i've hardly met anyone who's actually interviewed for a job because employers would much rather have someone who someone else can vouch for then have to interview a complete stranger and be like okay now you're on set like can you actually do the job yeah i think i had a conversation with linda a couple of months months ago even i don't know how long ago it was but we discussed i did a running job um for a netflix film years back like in my first year and um it was only in the makeup department i was just running in the makeup department um but the person who i got the job from was a family friend and then um Shelley has worked on every Disney movie you can think of um every like Marvel movie you can think of in the makeup department and the reason she got her job is because her boss liked her <laughs> so she would literally just take her to every job she went to um and that's how she got her jobs and I was discussing with Linda how important it is to have a good um not representation but make sure you're nice to people because that's what people remember and if you're horrible or rude that's they will also remember that <laughs> so make sure you have like yeah what's the right word I'm trying to say a good it's that positive positive attitude wouldn't you positive say? attitude yeah <laughs> so, yeah I think it's really important that you just really represent yourself well that you're polite that you're nice and it will get you so far in this industry um but yeah that's my main point really <laughs> Amazing, and how people don't forget to please put questions in the chat as well. But um, Joanna, you might have just covered it, but did was there anything that when you started working at Ardman that you learned there that you wish you knew from uni or you wish you knew going into that? Um, I think, I mean, well, one main thing is spreadsheets. I wish I knew a lot more about Excel because we have to use that all the time. Um, so I would definitely start using Excel more often at uni, even if it's just for like production timelines and stuff. Um, doing something like that professionally and accurately is really good. Um, but otherwise, I'm quite I'm a part of a quite a small team, so I'm kind of lucky I haven't been thrown in the deep end. There's not like too much I have to handle. <laughs> it wasn't overwhelming. It was quite a nice introduction into like the industry. Um, but I think. This is maybe not something I learned, but no, actually it is. I think over time I started being more comfortable asking questions. There were a lot of things that I didn't know how to do and I felt stupid not knowing how to do it. So I was too scared, which is a vicious cycle. But matter of fact, I should have just asked. And like, I'm so lucky, like my bosses and my um, producers just tell me what to do. Like they want to, they want me to ask questions. So never be afraid to ask a question if you don't know how to do something or you want to know more about something. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest thing I learned. <laughs> awesome. Um, so this is one that we kind of asked back at the producers conference back in June. But now that you guys have kind of you've left university and you've gone into the workplace, what does a typical day kind of I mean, obviously, working in the media industry nothing's ever typical we we all kind of get to experience that um but what what would you say is kind of a standard day of work for you guys either of uh, you can take first um yeah it, it again with like it might be different to joanna but with like production running it, as you said it's always going to be different so um you know Tomorrow, like the first two days of this shoot, I'm going to Cardiff to, you know, drive a Ford Transit van back and forth. Like, I'm delivery driver essentially, but um, someone has to do it, and so it, you know, it might change. But you know, like on you know a, a typical day, you know, it's always going to be an early start. So um, the sooner you get out of the student habit of waking up at 10 a.m., the better. And um, and it, 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 will, it will just depend on what the what the shoot is. It's just, you know, it can be a lot of heavy lifting, um, but equally, you know, it could be spending a day um, or half a day doing logging, you know, which is, you know, just listening and um, writing down like a transcript of, of the show. Um, 
or you know it, it, you will make teas sometimes but I think actually going on to um, the earlier chat about teas is it's one of the best things you can do because I've never seen a Kamuku happier than when I've turned up before coffees for them um, and it could be driving you know, one, one of my first my first ever experience actually doing running was driving the executive producers from ITV which was you know I was not being real I shit myself about that um, and yeah it would just depend I mean it, it would always be different but that's why we do the job isn't it because you don't want a nine to five office job you want you want to be out and about you want to be meeting people um, and you know you want to say that you know you've you've worked with like you know people like Gok and um, and have you know, have fun but yeah it, it, it wouldn't ever be typical but well, the only things I do stay, stay the same is it'll be long hours um, in an intense environment and uh, you have to get used to that and kind of going on like five or six hours sleep. I remember seeing the photo of you with Gok Wan and thinking, yeah. oh my God, you look so happy and he looks so, you're both beaming. Yeah, you, you wanted the picture of me, so I had to kind of, you know, had to do it, but no, it was, it was, no, it was lovely and and he was like one of the nicest guys I met actually. So it was, that, was, that was quite funny. It was quite great. Sorry, Ellie, I jumped in there. It was the Gok reference. I couldn't help it. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. Uh, same question to Joe. What does kind of a typical work day look like for you? Um, mine is quite different compared to Jane's. Um, at the moment, I'm only working part time. Um, so, and it, but every day is still really different. There'll be days where I'm inundated with emails like 20 like I'm literally working on emails for the whole entire shift <laughs> like there's no break and then there's days where um there's literally nothing so it's just kind of finding things to do um just keeping yourself occupied um yeah so it's it's nothing as an intense as James's but it's still it can really every day is different like you don't know what you're gonna have each yeah. morning so <laughs> I do think yeah. you yeah Joe would naturally kind of um run it down but like she is managing a whole academy but uh, it just does it very well um and so um yeah I, I, yeah every day is different but like in terms of what like joe's doing as well just like kind of jump in on that is um or, like if you want to go into production managing that kind of basis is what you want and yeah. that's what every production i've been on is the production manager sitting in the, in the office organizing the whole shoot and it's the emails and the excel sheets and that kind of thing, which you need to nail down because that will lead into call sheets and risk assessments, making number of phone calls per day. And it doesn't sound glamorous, but that is what that's what a shoot is built on. And yeah, so just for our jump yeah, in I, <laughs> I do have like, um, I'm really lucky enough to be working for such an amazing company at like and It's like, it's partner owned and they really invest, like value every employee there. So I've had one-to-ones with my boss and we've talked about my five-year plan and I really want to be a production manager. So I want to be on set at some point in the next five years. And we're both working to that point. I'm going to do courses, like I'm going to do training for this. And like, so I think it's really important that, even though maybe it's not something you necessarily want to do as your first job, um, you're a bit bored maybe some days. <laughs> I will admit that. Um, but it will get you to the point, you're working to that point you want to be at. Um, even if it is five years or 10 years, it will all add up to that point. So I think it's really important to never look down on a job because it's not what you want to do straight away. I think it's really important to take every opportunity you're given um, because it will get you somewhere. So, yeah. Amazing. We've got a question in the chat now. Harvey, I'm not sure if you want to ask it yourself or if you want me to. Uh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Well, it reads um, to both of you. Did anyone making short okay? Did making short films help with your employability? For example, are people more likely to hire you because you've made or worked on a short film? Um, I'd say definitely. Actually, um, I mean your your portfolio sometimes is what the first thing an employer sees, and they you know I've I've had interviews where um, they said yeah, I mean I didn't even look at your CV. I went straight to like your website or something, and especially if you want to go into camera work having something like a website or portfolio is um is what you need but also just showing that you're you've been around that environment and is never going to do you harm that's the main thing is like making a short film is never going to do you harm so why not kind of thing um and you know it's helped me in the sense that you know there will be 
weeks or months where you're, you can't get a production running job to begin with. Um, and in those in those interim periods that you keep yourself occupied so why not go out and make something um you know i i've been doing videography work for the past um, month up until i got offered this you know um this most recent running job and so it's never going to harm you and you know, sometimes it's the first thing employers see especially if you go into the camera department you know with the camera department every and i've spoken to so many camera crews now because i was at tonight you know i i will be there asking them so many questions probably be quite annoying sometimes but um they they always say to me like uh, nothing really changes apart what anything that changes the camera gets a bit bigger and has a bit, bit a bit of a bigger sensor but apart from that that camera theory you know of framing a shot or rule of thirds or leading lines will never change and you may as well just practice that now and so when it comes to maybe getting a camera job one day you can be like i know how to frame a shot you know or i know how to shoot today. so it's yeah, I would say a uh, short answer is yes, Kyle, you're making short films. Yeah, I think, yeah, it helps. Even from the paperwork aspect, that was kind of the main reasons I got the job I have now is because I could do paperwork in the base, most basic form of risk assessments, um, production timelines, um, copyright forms, all that stuff like, I learned how to do that and I could confidently say I can do paperwork basically <laughs> um, and I can make timelines and stuff so I think everything you learn on a short, a, sh a short film will help you somewhere so definitely definitely carry on making short films I miss making short films um, <laughs> but yeah <laughs> definitely keep on with that <laughs> well thank you could I just ask, um, sorry, sorry to cut across you, Rose. I just wanted to say, you know, like you are still making these films. You're still being active. You know, although you're working otherwise, you're still really making stuff for yourselves, aren't you? Do you think you'll be able to take that stuff into, you know, as you progress further? Or what else comes from making films? Just because I'm intrigued because I can't stop making films. And it's not just, it's not just for, um, you know, for it to be seen even. I'm just intrigued. Um, if you could just tell us about why you are still making those short films that, you know, obviously you started at, you know, you could, you'd started here with us doing. Can you tell us a bit about that, please? Yeah, it's, um, well, the thing is, if, if you don't in, enjoy, you know, what you do but it's like almost you can say like it's not a kind of it's not a job for you and so um no you, you I guess for me personally and I I make stuff because I want to carry on learning and so I know at this stage of of my career I'm I still have so much to learn just about camera theory let alone like learning to shoot on a on a bigger camera and you know you can do that in half an hour but knowing how to shoot is you know, completely different. So for me personally, it's kind of like, well, I want to continue learning and there's no point sitting on your laurels. Um, you know, don't uh, like, you know, you just, it's for me, like, as I said, it's for me personally, it's just about learning and, and moving forward and because I enjoy it. And when you get to that final edit and you've exported it, it's a nice feeling. You can put it on your, on your website. And for me personally, actually seeing my own work edited with my own camera stuff is, a much more gratifying experience than finishing a runner job and seeing my name on you know, an ITV credit, um, because that that product is is mine and mine only. So um, yeah, for, yeah, long again, long answer, but kind of um, it's more about just uh, enjoying what you do, and and if you can't enjoy what you do, then you should be doing something else. It's rewarding, yeah. It's, re it's a rewarding experience, and um. I still write things. I still get film ideas like every day and like I'm still jotting down stuff. And I think, you know, at the moment I can't make anything. It's still so nice just to write scripts and write down film ideas and ha just have ideas about things you want to make. And like, I saw, I've, been, I've seen June twice already. Um, and that film inspires me every time I see it. And it gets me excited again. I think James will know, like there's certain films where I watch and I just get, so excited about being in film I'm like this is amazing it's great we're like on such a great job like great industry like it, the possibilities are endless for whatever you can make so yeah I just I think it's, it's rewarding it it's enjoyable and I think as long as it makes you happy why not like carry on making stuff oh uh, yeah I think that's what's really important 
Just to go back a little bit to Harvey's question and to touch on something you said, James, about putting stuff on your website, what would be a good baseline to be stepping out of uni with? Would you say some sort of social media presence, a website, portfolio? What do you think would be good there? Um, uh, the biggest thing for me is was to have a website just because the last thing you want to do on your CV is be posting six, seven links to YouTube because an employer will look at that. First of all, it looks messy. Second of all, it makes the CV four or five pages long. But third of all, if you can say, hi there, no, here's my website. It's www.jamesfoxfilm.com. A little plug there for everyone. Um, then it suddenly looks so much cleaner because um, you know your stuff's all in one place. And to go to an employer and say, hi, this is my website, is so much more professional than posting these long um, URLs for YouTube videos. And so you don't need to have a Facebook. You don't need, I mean, I have an Instagram and I, and I have a website. That's all I have. And it's for a specific purpose of it might give me some videography work, but also an employer could look at that and say, well, that's quite neat and clean. He seems organized. And that's it's just about presenting yourself in a certain way. And but having a website, I mean, I, I pay for the web link just because having that clean website link also means, OK, he looks a little bit organized and it could make you stand out. And, uh, and obviously I have a long way to go and I plan to expand it to having like you know a page about my running work and then. There's nothing stopping me putting logos on now. I mean, I, I, I've asked and I, and I can put ITV and Channel 4 logos on my website and suddenly that's lifting off the page. It's like, okay, no, we're, we're talking business here. And so, um, yeah, I'd say at, at the very least, just leave a website, make it on Wix. It's really simple. Um, there's so many great templates. Get where you work on there and pay like three quid a month for the um, for a web link. And that will go so far, in my opinion. I mean, I've done a couple interviews for jobs I might potentially have in the future where I always ask in my interview, and this is actually thanks to Joanna, one of her bits of advice, is um, to ask what was the best thing about my CV? What made it, what stood out to you? And on a lot of the interviews I've had, um, and my most recent one for a job that I might have after this one has been, um, oh, like the first thing I noticed was your website. Like it was so organized and stuff. So yeah, just leave a website at the very least. Well, I'm just gonna follow on from that. Um, yeah, if you don't have a website, just somewhere where all your work is in one place like your linkedin page i've got all my work on my linkedin page so if anything they ask for something like that i can just send them like my linkedin page so that's also a backup um i think it's really important to have a good cv um and it should be no more than two pages if two pages um like james says it needs to be easy to read um have all the information on there in like a quick easy way to read um yeah so just make sure it's brief that has everything you've done on there. well important things you've done on there don't put random small jobs that kind of have nothing to do <laughs> with what you want to do but like yeah yeah <laughs> brilliant thank you so much for that guys um, yes Thank you, everybody. I want to just bring in because she's been waiting really patiently in the wings and she's part of the RTS. In fact, the chairman of the Devon and Cornwall branch, Siobhan, can you? Hello. Hi there. Hi, I was hiding. I was listening, but I was hiding. I didn't. <laughs> but here I am. Hi, everyone. Great to have you. Great to have you. Um, and and I'm just wondering, you know, sort of listening into it, what everyone's saying, do you concur? Or you, do you agree with what you're hearing? Absolutely, yes. Um, in terms of the CV, keeping it very easy to read and scan, make sure for any typos, especially if you're saying that you like to pay attention to detail as one of your you know, great attributes and then you've got loads of spelling mistakes that kind of go straight in the bin, I'm afraid. So, you know, make sure that you hold up um, your examples in that way and I think it is an excellent idea in terms of being able to go to a one simple click to a portfolio absolutely and that you can always keep up to date um, even as your CV changes and it's also worth um, I I actually have like two three CVs um, they're, they're kind of catered for different types of jobs or different things so like Joanna was saying you don't want to put all those everything on there and all those little bits but having perhaps a second CV that might perhaps go towards a different skill set may be worthwhile having as well. Um, and that will kind of happen probably as you get more jobs and as you go through the industry. 
um, you'll find that you might actually have picked up a couple of skills and it might be worth having two CVs that help cater depending on what type of job you're going for. So Siobhan, like James and Joanna really kindly like shared their experience and it's really new but could, would you mind telling us about your very first beginnings as well? I'm sensing that you're thinking mine's not very new though Linda there. <laughs> 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 um, yes, that's correct. Um, I um, I went to Plymouth University. I studied English for three years um, because I didn't know if I wanted to be a lawyer or a journalist. Um, and I decided being a journalist was going to be more interesting, but not as well paid as a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and then I went and did a master's um, down in Falmouth for a year and graduated after um, that just in 2009. And I got my first job straight away from graduating and it was through work experience from being on the course of when people were saying before the break um third year getting your work experience in and going working for free yes just go do it um you know if you can take that opportunity it really does pay off um so I got my job from doing a work experience um gig with a company that were filming in the area and looking for runners um, and then I kept an eye on that company for any upcoming vacancies and I saw that they had a vacancy going. Um, so I applied and they remembered me. I still had to go through the interview process, but thankfully I was employed by them and, and had a great three years, which then led me on my journey, which um, I basically I went into live streaming and uh, I was live streaming music festivals and events um, with the local company to begin with. And then I was ready for a bigger jump um, to take um, you know, a bigger step for myself. And I went off and I set up a web channel for the poker company, World Series of Poker. Um, and that led me to go and streaming um, poker in Europe and in Las Vegas for three years which was amazing, <laughs> but also very tiring, as people were saying about long hours. Um, you know, you don't sleep a lot um, when you're doing those kind of jobs, you know, kind of live it, breathe it. Um, but it, it was wonderful. And I had the most amazing time and I learned so much and I got to work with some amazing people. And as um, was said before the break, lots of job opportunities come from your classmates. You know, if you've got a good group that, you know, you'd like to keep in contact with, you might not all necessarily be going for the same jobs, though some of you will. So look out for each other in the interview rooms <laughs> because um, you'll, you'll probably see each other. But the best thing is to support each other, build each other up, keep an eye out for opportunities, send each other jobs that you think that might actually seek someone else rather than yourself. And you'll find that actually, you know, I'm, I'm still friends with my, my group from over 11 years ago now. Um, absolutely adore them. We still meet up and um, we still even look out for jobs for each other if, if people are interested, though we're a bit more settled now. Um, but yeah, that's it's a great asset if you can, you know, stay connected to your classmates because so many opportunities come from that. That's really great advice. And, and, and also, I mean, that really echoes what James and Joan have been saying. And it's really absolutely a lived truth that people do look after people that have been kindly or positive. You've had a good experience with them. We hear it over and over again. So um, it's really good to know. But Sean, can you tell us a little bit about the RTS? Because, you know, we'd like to know a bit more, if you don't mind, about just what happens down here in Devon and Cornwall. And um, yeah, we're all ears. <laughs> Not a problem at all. Well, I'm, I'm here to talk about the RTS because um, obviously, you know, Plymouth University, University of Plymouth are hosting this great workshop today. And as, as the television society and representative for this region, we want to encourage more workshops and and times where people can have resources to help them break into industry. So the Royal Television Society is an educational charity, it's a national charity, and uh, the patron is the Prince of Wales um, and has been since 1997. And essentially the Royal Television Society as a charity, we host events involving government ministers and industry CEOs, and uh, we have our own awards um, ceremonies both national and regional for industry professionals but we also have our own student awards as well which if any of you sign up as members which by the way is completely free if you're a student to sign up as an RTS member you get to enter into the student awards 
which is a great opportunity for your work to be seen by industry professionals, both in the region, but also nationally. Um, a lot of our uh, previous students, not just the winners, have actually been snapped up by people such as um, Beagle and 2-4 and the BBC because they're part of my um, committee. We have representatives from all the broadcasters, both the main big channels that you know, but also some independents. They get to see this work and go, oh my gosh, that person's brilliant. I love their work. We're looking for someone like that. Um, and so lots of people have actually got work and a job because um, of just being part of the um, of the student awards. Um, we also have conferences and workshops. Um, so as a student, if you are a, a member, you get to come to a lot of our workshops that are completely free. And many industry professionals are also at these workshops. So it's a great opportunity for you to network with people in the region who might have work going. Um, or even just to be able to give you a bit of advice and just build up your network. And also you get to meet like-minded people like yourselves. And it might be that you're running your own job and that you're looking for people who you want to work on your project. So that's a, it's a great way to meet other people who obviously are trying to do the same thing as you. Um, the Royal Television Society also, we offer um, bursaries um, to help those from less affluent backgrounds to get a foothold in the industry. So it's worth going on the website and looking at our bursary scheme if you are needing some financial support to help you. Uh, we offer education and training from industry experts. And obviously, like I said, we're a network of professionals, essentially. Um, I think there's about 5,000 full members in the country, which is quite cool. Um, and we're supported by global broadcasters, um, you know, like the BBC, Sky, Channel 4 and ITV. Um, and I think basically that, I mean, from a student perspective, I think that's all you really need to probably know about us at this time. But if you, yeah, if you join the RTS, um, like I said, as it's for free, it will give you lots of opportunity to meet um, industry professionals, get your work into our student awards and get it seen by, you know, people who are often hiring. And Siobhan, is there that 30 for 30 scheme? Um... So we've got like a, an RTS features um, scheme, which helps people who are in their initial years of industry as well. So we have like a mentorship program as well to help people along as they're just starting out. So we're, our, our focus is to help develop anyone who's in the industry, whether you are 18, 25, 55, 88, you know, we, we want to look after people who work in the industry and ensure that they better themselves um, and whether that's your recent graduate or you know someone quite seasoned. Yeah I was just thinking about um, James and Joanna there <laughs> and our other our other third years who've graduated but oh, yeah definitely look at about. the futures look at the futures scheme um, that will be worthwhile for you. Okay well we've we just got a few minutes left really of this session and it was just to say um, uh, um, the next talk it will be coming from Falmouth University and I believe they've got uh, a production designer called Joel Collins who's going to be talking about um, his work um, or his dark materials and black mirror so that's something of interest for everybody I just wondered if we could just round up with the people that we've got here now top tips because I, I do see James and Joanna putting in more tips in the chat. So can we just have one like last roundup, please, before we have to leave it, of your top tips for, for us to get, get on and, and, and we'd appreciate it. So, um, so either Joanna, would you mind taking it away first and then James, and then we'll round up with Siobhan, if that's okay. Um, I think make a good impression and be nice to people and save a CV on your, your name. That's my three top tips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll just say um for cover letters we always research the comp a company before you like you can always have a template it's fine but always have a sentence which only someone who's read their website would know so you show you've actually put the effort into to research them bullet point your cv and you know don't just send normal applications send preemptive ones and last one just be um put, put uh, professionals have into practice now with your student films and uh, that will be honestly in the long term that will do you some good. 
And, and yes, I'd like to add in terms of um, what James is saying about making sure that you know the company, um, especially if you are applying for a job that is advertised and they say, feel free to call us, call them. Like they're not just saying that. Um, it, it's amazing how many people will not call a, a company, even though they're saying, feel free to have an informal chat with us. That's your opportunity to like sell your personality on that phone call before that piece of paper lands in their email or on their desk they'll remember you from that phone call and it, it is really worth just saying um you know to have that conversation so if you've got that opportunity to speak to someone at the company do so um don't be shy and um I definitely say that you know once you probably are starting to get into work and positions don't just wait for people to help you in terms of your skill development yes do ask for help and things but there was this one chap who I worked with for probably three years um, and he's doing amazing. He's working on Bake Off now. He's finally moved out of region and he's, he's working on some really great shows. And I'm really proud of him because basically he just stuck to his guns for what he wanted to go and work on. And he spent so much of his free time researching and developing his own skill set. And like he realized he didn't quite know how to do something. So basically he was my, he was my camera op and editor, but he realized that he wanted to get better he would spend his own time while still in work to to improve his skill set um and I would just say it was invaluable and then like I became you know I relied on him he he as a producer I knew I could trust him because he just became such an invaluable kind of employee and um his enthusiasm his genuine enthusiasm for his craft was was fantastic so you always wanted to work with him because you knew if you couldn't if you didn't quite know it You'd figure out how to do it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Siobhan. I think it's true. This enthusiasm is such a key, key thing. And I, I just would like to say, you know, thank you to all of our guests, you know, from the first panel, but also this one now, you know, to James and to Joanna and Siobhan and also, you know, um, Rose and, you know, Ellie, who've been um, handling the, the session superbly. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to hand over to Al, but first, um, who's going to wind up our session for us. But I'd just also like to say thank you to our technical expert, Jamie Carmichael, who's kept the whole thing on the air. So thanks to that uh, person, uh, Jamie, for doing that. We really appreciate your, your input. I'm just going to hand over to Al now to wind up our session, but thank you all very much. I'm going to be really quick because I'm sure people um, want to get off the Zoom, but yeah. Thank you so much for everyone um, for attending um, and all our guests. I think there were some brilliant um, sort of um, nuggets of information, tips and insights um, there. And I'm going to try to sum up in like 30 seconds. So, you know, I think Esther's position as an artist, filmmaker and writer, you know, thinking about life in a way in which, you know, incoherency and coherency are perhaps not as clear as what we like to think they are. And so kind of embracing, embracing yourself, really, I think was some of her message is, you know, and if you really want to know where you want to go, I think like James did, you know, you go for it. Um, but if you want to, you know, make films and, and, and you want to be a, a director and a writer director, and you're not quite sure yet you can go. It's OK to just work in, in, in you know, in, in, as a cleaner and just keep working on your art, art practice. So, you know, that's something to take into account. I think there's all different ways that you can find your own way um, after you leave graduation. I think Katie said some really good things that I'm really um, glad about. And I think it's really important about our course and what we're trying to do. You know, she um, has found ways into the gallery space um, and filmmaking as a moving image medium and finding those collectives and possibilities of securing funding um, so that she can pr pursue her kind of practice in that way, which is, you know, fantastic to hear, you know, Arts Council funding, working with local community art groups, you know, to get in touch with people, you know, they can support you, you know, film collectives wherever you are, um, people that are there and got, they've got funding to support your development. So make sure you're aware about, you know, becoming aware of those things. And I think she also said, you know, being good across fields is, is really important. I think that goes for like the film and television industry, or, you know, in this broad umbrella idea of film, you know, being able to, and as Katie said, if you're a DOP, 
yeah, maybe you want to be the next Roger Deakins, but when you when you're starting out, maybe Katie hires you to be the DOP of her, you know, weird art film that some of you might be like, what the hell is this? But you're you're learning, you're experimenting, you're adding things to your CV, and I think to to, to, to add to what James and Joanna are saying, you're curious, you want to do the work, you want to learn, uh, and, and Siobhan as well, and that's going to make you more appealing, um, professional. Um, be kind, personal, professional. I think that was um, like coming through loads. Um, being a runner, you know, it actually can be a tiring but amazing job and you're at very important to get that experience. Um, and then James and Joanna just said some really lovely things about, you know, doing the details. I really like, like that, James, doing the details right, which you can all which you can all do now. And then, you know, Joanna, you know, um, it's an exciting and rewarding world, you know, film and TV. Um, and to not lose sight of that because that's why we're all here. So yeah, thank you, Linda, for 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 and seeing that so brilliantly. Thank you to everyone that came. I thought it was super useful, and I think it's a great way to kickstart this series of sessions, which is aimed primarily at, at, at students. So thank you for coming. Please go to the next ones. Um, and yeah, have a lovely evening, James and Joanna. It's so good to see you. Catch up soon, okay? And um, everyone else, bye and have a nice evening. Thank you.